let's just start with an introduction. Jenny, could you take us through who you are and what your company does? Hi, so um, I'm uh, the ND for Revive Hong Kong, and um, what Revive do is IV vitamin wellness strips. Uh, you may know what uh, intravenous strips are from hospitals where people, when they're normally sick, they uh, might end up having an IV in the hospital. Now, we're very different to that in the sense that we're actually um, in the preventative healthcare industry, uh, so we're not so reactive where you, know, you get sick and you go to hospital, but actually you're looking after your well-being through maintaining your wellness through IV hydration vitamin drinks. And why this would be a way to maintain your health would be that through IV, you 100% absorb vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants in order to rebalance your body's equilibrium and then flush out the toxins in your body. And very quickly, you can bring your body from a suboptimal level to an optimal level in half an hour. So that's the sort of difference between having anything orally um, to having an IV. And I can go into more detail that was amazing. I think Thanks. I want some. Um, <laughs> so next up, we have Guava Pass's general manager, Antonia. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi. So um, I work for this company called Guava Pass, uh, which is basically an aggregator for boutique fitness studios. Um, we're live in 12 different cities across Asia um, and the Middle East. And essentially what it is, is it allows you to create your own uh, workout based on your activity preferences and your location. So you could be doing yoga in Central or martial arts in Causey Bay. Um, it's up to you to choose whatever you want to do. So it's a very flexible program. Um, it also, um, you, you don't actually have to commit for long periods of time, which is what makes it very attractive. You can cancel after a month if you decide you don't want to use it. Um, and you can also use it whenever you travel as well. Um, so that's just the fitness side of Guava Pass. But what we're doing with Guava Pass is essentially sort of, you know, building out and branching out into the entire uh, wellness community. So we do partner with you know, healthy F&B uh, companies, yoga apparel brands, that sort of thing, essentially sort of embodying the whole spirit of wellness and the community. Fantastic. And next up, we have Dervla, the founder of Compare Retreats. Tell us a little bit more about that. Thank you, Nikki. Um, so Compare Retreats is an online booking portal and magazine for the best luxury health and fitness retreats in the whole world. Um, all of our reviews are written by qualified health and fitness professionals. We do a lot of white papers for the industry about um, like the evolution of yoga in Hong Kong dating back from 1971 to 2018. We're trying to be a provider for a wellness travel content, but also inspire people and motivate them and give them information to travel in a way that improves their, their health and their well-being, both mentally and physically. Um, and we are based in Hong Kong. Our magazine is in English and Chinese. Our booking portal will, will be soon. And that's it for me. Fantastic. All right. I'm going to jump right in if you ladies don't mind. So the big question we have in the industry is the digital landscape in Hong Kong. Uh, so. All of you have decided to start this in Hong Kong uh, with the digital landscape evolving almost monthly at this point. Can you tell us a little bit about what do you see as the catalyst change in the wellness industry? Because the wellness and lifestyle industry is booming at the moment. What do you think is causing it in Hong Kong? And this might be one of the reasons you are also activated in Hong Kong. Um, so any travel company is usually global, but what we found is outbound travelers from Hong Kong are very poor in time and rich in assets. Um, so the demand for wellness and health, not only for travel, but for new fitness trends and new health trends and having things at your doorstep, they're very, very fast doctors. Um, and then it's also the wellness landscape in Hong Kong is very, very small. So if you have a good concept, people are very supportive of one another. Like we, very, we, we, we work with the communities, we work with all the different companies in Hong Kong and all the different influencers in Hong Kong that are doing things because we know that's how, when you're in wellness, you really, you want people to succeed that are in the same business as you. 
things like Iris Hong Kong, Pure Yoga, like you, these, these are facilitators of making people well and happy and healthy. So, and there's a very positive outlook and positive mental well-being in Hong Kong as well, which I find kind of fuels it too. I do have to say the Hong Kong market is uh, a bit lopsided. Um, it's very much uh, an international sort of expat community with Hong Kong, and a lot of our demographic actually is um, overseas uh, clientele, so people who have been educated abroad um, who are very much um, reciprocating these trends that we have seen from the West. Um, they're very much embracing it, they're looking for new things, they do have uh, placed a lot of emphasis on investing their time into wellness, um, and especially where a market like Hong Kong is very competitive, uh, we apparently have the longest working weeks um, in Hong Kong and well, you know, compared to the rest of the world. Um, so I think there's a lot of emphasis for even um, employers as well to just sort of place, put in place corporate wellness programs as well. And there's increasing budget and that sort of thing for, um, to work with uh, companies like Wallapass to help that instill that in the workforce. I don't think it was difficult at all because I think Hong Kong really needs, um, with, with the busy lifestyle that everyone has in Hong Kong, you just mentioned you know, the really long working hours, it's the everyday life, it's the responsibilities that we, ha we have. Um, we're so busy in what we do and sometimes we don't take care of ourselves because we're so busy in work um, or flying somewhere or you know there's always an activity going on in Hong Kong there's so many events and you know I could go on about how demanding life can be sometimes and you end up feeling just absolutely drained and tired and so for me bringing Revive to Hong Kong is a no-brainer when I tried uh, the Revive IV drip I instantly felt that energy boost um, normally when I'm very very busy I get quite sick um, I end up having a cold that then develops into uh, maybe a throat infection um, but having the IV really really helped me um, basically go on and um, do what I need to do in life because it's busy in Hong Kong there's just too much to do I think for us, um, it's, it's definitely uh, internet search that people find us, um, as well as word of mouth. So for us, it's all about having the content available online, because your consumer is, is, is very savvy. You're, you're going to do your research, you know, what is it that's going to help you um, maintain your wellness? And if you get an IV drip, you're going to want to know, you know, is this safe? Does this work? and ask a lot of questions and being able to engage your consumer in, in that sense is I think very important and especially for our business um, we, we have doctors, nurses and people will want to know you know who's going to give me my IV and having that content available online um, is essential for us. So with that being said, what your strategy is? Um, because we're an online service provider, um, I'd say email marketing is probably our number one top channel in terms of driving conversions. Um, so every month we'll have a campaign, um, say it's International Yoga Day or like Christmas or Valentine's Day, 
we'll do like a, a two class promotion, like work out with your loved one, that sort of thing. We'll do flash sales. And I know this sounds really bad, but we actually spam a lot of people. We do say, oh, 30, like, you know, two days left to get this deal, that sort of thing. Um, but you'll be amazed, like, even though people do sort of opt out of receiving emails, but this incessant messaging of like this deal with these, the sense of urgency to get that offer, um, people actually do ultimately convert. And it's, it's very successful for us. Interesting. And Dervla, you're playing a not a product approach, a more review based. How does that, how does that work with advertising? Because there, how do you measure return of investment for that? So we make money in two ways. We have um, native advertising and content packages to help build companies SEO. So we are an authority and by doing articles about other companies and brands in the wellness and lifestyle space, we help them grow their presence. We also do um, influencer marketing for our properties. We do, and we also do, we're a booking portal. So we, we work the same way booking.com does on the online booking portal. Um, but for us, with, with content and with our conversion, the customer journey was something that we did before we started, before we ever, so every single piece of content, in a way, whether it was to inspire, to motivate, or to inform, in a way it all leads back to our booking portal. So we market every single, I think that people now create content just to create content, the most, the best time that you can spend is actually sitting down and creating a content calendar and then spending time on the marketing of that one article or that one piece because you can actually break down a, one article that you've spent 150 USD to create. You can break it down into a podcast. You can break it down into an email newsletter. You can do, it, you can do images on Pinterest and everything should be, a content plan in the very beginning should all lead back to your one KPI. Thing. So it's, it's more of a story-driven approach that you would take. All right. And with that being said, then, let's twist this a little bit. All three of you didn't mention social media. So I'm going to poke a little bit there. Facebook, Instagram, uh, two of the arguably largest platforms in Hong Kong. How does it work for you and where does it fit in your whole strategy? Because digital marketing is just one component. Where does it fit? Social media. Definitely for us, you know, a very new concept to um, when somebody actually comes in and has an IV drip, they actually post it um, onto their Facebook or Instagram. And um, what's really interesting is you get lots of comments on there like, oh, are you okay? And, you know, take care of yourself. And you know, what happened? you're in hospital, so you automatically... It's think, a medical emergency. <laughs> yeah, um, and, and, and what our goal is really to actually educate people in terms of the, the benefits of IVs and, and that it's not medication that's necessarily in there, it's, it's vitamins, minerals and antioxidants which help boost your immune system and boost your energy levels, and so it's a lot more positive and it's benefit to health care. So you're doing... Things consumer-led postings on social media. So it's your clients that are posting it. Okay, interesting. Yeah, so a bit of both and, um, you know, including testimonials from clients as well, um, because you, you trust that, you know, if, say, your friend's done it, then you'll want to go and try and you'll, you'll ask them, so how was it? Um, and it's, it's through the storytelling of uh -huh. the experience that helps um, I guess other people understand how it works and the benefits. Gotcha. Antonia, is this true for your business as well? Um, yeah, actually very, very true what Jenny just said. Um, referrals, uh, word of mouth is very, very important because no one's really going to sort of believe in a product or a brand if uh, someone reputable or someone they trust hasn't actually tried it themselves. Um, but that said, with, um, with social media, we actually struggle to get conversions on Facebook and Instagram. Um, it just has to be very clear with the funnel that you put people through because if they don't have exposure to it, if it's not like a paid sort of media strategy, people get lost in the messaging. Um, so say for Guapas, if you come to the page, you might not realize they're like, okay, what are all these workouts? Don't really know what it is. 
Um, unless you have brand messages that's clear about what it is, then takes you to like another page where you're like, okay, we can sign up with these packages. Um, and then, or something else that leads on to like, okay, what it actually is and have a clear call to action. Um, it's easy to get lost um, within that. Um, so Instagram, Facebook, we actually use um, more Instagram for creating content, um, telling stories. Um, I find um, stories for Instagram actually is, it's quite useful. Um, people are always kind of like, what does this work out? Looks really cool. People are engaging with you. Um, and stories are more effective than an actual post, I find. Um, and Facebook is more kind of, we use it for events, promote things like blog content, that sort of thing as well. So we so kind longer of storytelling is on Facebook, mm -hmm. whereas on Instagram, you're doing short bursts of story that are consumer driven. All right. I have a slightly more technical question for you here, um, if I may. Your website covers multiple, multiple pages, right? Slightly different to the two businesses because you have to cover hundreds of them possibly, if not thousands. So when you do a Facebook ad, do you take them to your homepage? And if not, where and why on Facebook and Instagram? So we have, first of all, I'm an, I'm an editor. So my background is content and milking content until I get the last ring out of it is, is what I do. Um, so we don't usually put them back to our homepage. So basically, if, if you want to have a look at what we do on our Instagram account or on our Facebook page, for Instagram, we have usually a series of a pattern of 14 posts. Uh, the first post will send someone to a dedicated country and retreats in that country. The next one will be an inspirational post just to get people to get some traction, to, to inspire people to travel better. The next page will maybe go back to uh, an expert reviewer and then link the person back to all the retreats that they've reviewed. Another one might go to a certain, a certain retreat, a certain retreat type. So we have retreat types. We have retreats, we have destinations, and then we have specific retreats. So we have a lot of pages. So we have a certain pattern that we do, and then our stories follow a certain pattern as well. I completely agree with what the lady said. Uh, Instagram for us and Facebook for us are aspirational. SEO, LinkedIn, I've been, LinkedIn, is a, LinkedIn and Pinterest are actually very big for us. That never happens. question then, how are you guys capturing all this data? Because there's enormous amount of data, everyone here that's running a business is going to be capturing data from everywhere. How are you guys managing to store all of this, especially the digital and the non-digital component of it? How do you, do you merge it together? Do you put it somewhere else? How does it work in your businesses? Google Analytics, sorry.
when we get calls like something's happening to my Google Analytics. I don't know what's happening. Can you please tell me what's happening there? Um, yeah, okay. That, that's a very important point. Um, so I would love to dig a little bit deeper here on how you can bring out, you guys mentioned social media, you guys mentioned customers, but KOLs, I don't know, do we have any KOLs in the house? Just in case, no? Oh, right. hi Vivian. Um, so this is very interesting, right? There's horror stories of KOLs, there's amazing stories of KOLs. Tell us your journey and have you tried it? Are you thinking about trying it? What's the plan? We've definitely tried KOLs and it's worked really, really well for us um, just because of the business that we are. Um, you know, you, you aspire to be the KOL or, um, you know, you look up to them. And, and that gives the, that initial touch point to uh, the consumer where they're like, oh, what is this? It's an IV drip. What is that? And it, it, it gives that spark to ask questions. And when you start asking questions, that's when you go probably onto Google and you start doing your research. Funnel in. Yeah, um, which again is why our website is very important to raise our SEOs. But at the same time, you've got Facebook and Instagram which do come up as well in the research and, and then they see other people. All right, and, and so for, for the both of you, how, how did you use KOL? Because I know Guava Pass, you've used KOLs all around. Can you tell us a little bit about the journey? So it's worked really well in Southeast Asia, um, having influences there. Uh, we have a lot of uh, women that aspire to, well, they live this kind of lifestyle that we're kind of portraying to our target audience. Um, they're already working out, they're healthy, they're active, they love it. Um, so we have Guava Girl influences who are just happy to promote it, to be an ambassador, have free workouts, that sort of thing. Um, in Hong Kong, I've actually had very sort of, um, it's very hit or miss with me. Um, I've realized now I feel like the influence market in Hong Kong is actually a bit tainted. I feel like a lot of the influencers are actually expecting a lot more. They're charging a lot per post um, and they're not necessarily driving conversions for us. So the problem is really that I'm having is trying to find the right influencer um, and justifying whether or not they should be sort of paid uh, whatever it is they're asking for. Um, also, even though we sign contracts with influencers, a lot of them actually sometimes don't deliver as well. And you don't want to be in a situation where it's like, okay, well, you didn't post this, you didn't use this caption, la la la, and have to edit the post. Like, it's very sort of time consuming, and you don't want to be that brand that's kind of like nitpicking at, at the influences. Um, so that's kind of one of the struggles that I've had with working with various people. Uh, but it's kind of crazy to see like a university um, marketing um, company just reached out to me recently, and for 18 year old influencers, they're really charging like 5,000 per post, and these people have 10,000 followers. I'm kind of like, look, well, first of all, we don't really have students and they're using Guava Pass, you're not quite the demographic, but it was shocking, really. So, I to the question, a lot of new businesses are wondering, should they pay for it, should they not pay for it? They're a little conservative. I don't think you should. Um, it depends, though. If you have, I just think that you should work with brands and people that you really, that really, really love your product. For me, I'm lucky. One area that in the influencer market and in the services market as well, if you have a service and not maybe just a product, some people are usually happy to post for free. We only work with the best luxury retreats in the entire world. So when you get an email in your inbox being like, hey, you're pregnant, we want to promote a pregnancy retreat, we're gonna send a photographer to you, would you and your husband like to go on a free trip? The answer is usually, the answer is usually left, yes. However, the biggest problem with influencers that I find is that you can have someone with a million followers, but you need to ask yourself, you need to really look through those people, you need to find their demographic. If, they're, if it's a super yogi and their followers are 18 years old, they can't afford my product, you know? Like, so I might get more likes. So, you know, you can do it for more likes. You can do it for brand awareness. You can do it if you need to engage with a different demographic, like men, for example. But if you are trying to drive conversions, don't expect that if you pay an influencer 100,000 USD, unless it's Kim Kardashian, <laughs> that you're gonna have a ton of sales, you know? So just, just be careful. There, there's wiser ways to spend your money, I find. Um, and you can do, so micro-influencers, instead of, um, we recently did an article on 34 women leading the wellness revolution in Hong Kong. 
I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, and th it's much more effective to engage with 34 different women leading the wellness revolution for a female oriented wellness product than only hitting one. So, you know, be smart. And if someone really loves your product, they'll usually do it for free. Interesting. So one, one of the key insights I got from some of the audience members here today is um, the chaos. Where do you know? You've never done KO marketing. Like, where do you start? Do you go online? So am Excel. I correct in Excel. saying like... Huh? <laughs> start an Excel spreadsheet. Start an Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, just... yep, I think that is the strategy. Um, and um, so let me just summarize this for the audience. Uh, for those of you not familiar with KOLs already, it's influencers within the wellness industry that basically work with you in barter or will work with you either just because they love your product and sometimes for money as well. And one of the key things, so all three of you are saying, is definitely navigate to find out their audience before you pay a single dollar. And you guys mentioned working across multiple regions as well. Doing global revive. Is it is revive planning to go Southeast Asia with your marketing already? What is the plan for APEC and where does Hong Kong stand in that positioning? Actually, Hong Kong's the first revive uh, wellness clinic in Asia and, and is our flagship um, wellness center. Um, and we do have a plan to expand further into Asia because it's, it's wellness for everyone, really, and all the busy cities need it. So we're in the process right. of... Um, and, and do you start doing market research by Facebook or Instagram or starting to write some postings? Is that part of the plan? Is digital the first entry point? Um, absolutely. So a lot of our bookings are tracked in terms of where um, our, our clients come from. So being the first in Asia, we've actually got people coming from all over Asia to the Hong Kong um, center, and as well as internationally um, from Europe, US. Um, so, so yeah. We, we, You've got we, a global data right here. Exactly. Got it, got it. And Tony, how about yourself? Um, so Singapore was actually the first market that we launched in um, and then Hong Kong and Bangkok simultaneously soon after. Um, we're now in 12 cities across Asia and Middle East um, and Bahrain and India being the most recent ones we've launched in. I'm not responsible for those markets but I know for India um, because I reshare the one same Hootsuite account that all the cities are using so I can see when all the scheduled posts are there for, for India and they, def they definitely have used digital as their first entry point as you mentioned. You're building the hype about it, you're building the presence and then as soon as you have the content people will just you know, tune in and see what you're up to. Is this similar for your side as well? Um, do, you, do you use digital as the forefront in your marketing strategy? Or is it an offline presence as well? The funny thing about I thought when I first started that everyone wanted to do everything online. With luxury travel, people still want the one-on-one -on -one experience. I get a lot of emails from people sitting at, the, at their desk being like, I'm so burnt out, I don't know where to go, I have three days, I don't care how much it is, where can we go? And that's, that's why I've embedded, I mean, when you start a company, you are embedded in your brand anyways, but it's become very one-on-one. -on -one. So digital is really important for us, especially being in Hong Kong and being a global brand. And we have put a lot of money, time, and effort into each of these platforms. But I think at the end of the day, the most important, the, the way that your company grows is that if people have a good experience in Revive, if people have great experience in Guava Pass, if people have had a life-changing retreat with us. So digital is fine, but it uh, needs to, I mean, it all should come back to the story. So if I swing this right at another question, is offline marketing dead, or should it be what you're doing both? Not at all. Um, you know, we do um, lots of uh, events within corporate businesses, and for us, because we are medical, um, people want, that sort of personal touch. So I guess it really depends on you know what your product is, and for us, it's uh, medical and it's IV hydration. So it's important to be able to speak to you know our nurses who, who also come to the events, and um, we also have our doctor that will do workshop uh, talks around health and well-being. So like there's a lot of offline events, such yeah, as this one. with with um, more of an educational approach. Got it, got it. And 
Is that the same for golf bus? Um, yeah, so unfortunately with um, events, we don't really drive any conversions to them, but we still kind of have to do them as more of a brand awareness type of activity. Um, it also gives us um, a lot of, I wouldn't say like maybe free press, but a lot of publications do want to know what's going on in Hong Kong if you do have an event, and they'll, they'll happily list it for you for free. Um, we've had really great success with one event that we've been working on. Um, it's a dog yoga event because it was Year of the Dog. And because it kind of went viral with the press it received, people actually made video content for us. Uh, we're now doing, uh, organizing our third one um, next month um, on June the 9th. And that's to raise awareness about um, the Yulin Dog Meat Festival in, in China. So all the proceeds from that are actually going towards helping, um, helping the dogs out there. Got it. Um, I, I do want to ask one more question on the uh, dog yoga component. It's, if you search dog yoga right now on Google, um, and Hong Kong. Kuala Lumpur shows up. And was that part of the plan? Is find something so unique that you would be the only player? Um, yes, ultimately with everything you want to do, you want to be the first. Um, and we've actually done that with another campaign that we did um, with the Guava 18 Challenge. Um, it was basically do 18 different workouts at 18 different studios in the month of January. It didn't do a massive competition. We had the only hashtags for hashtag Guava 18, one of 18, that sort of thing. So stuff like that that's unique, it actually does go viral. Um, and with dog yoga, we had, um, no one's actually ever done that in Hong Kong before either. So um, that actually worked very well to our advantage. Fantastic. And so I have one more question then. How, you mentioned hashtags, you mentioned competitions. A uh, dangerous game I've heard from many startups is they start up the company, day two they're running a competition. And then about day three, they're complaining why nothing's happening. Uh, can you shed some insight? How did you get started with competitions with so many rumors about never to do competitions until a later stage of your business? But you guys seem to have done it in the first six months and it still works. How did you manage to do that? Um, one thing that you, in Hong Kong, it's really important as a new startup is to you know, find people that have a similar demographic to you and do partnerships especially as a small business. Um, I was lucky enough that I worked at some publications that had a very nearly identical demographic to what I needed. Um, we did giveaways with Sassy um, Media Group. We grew our database hugely in the first like three months. Um, and then also we do partnerships with, we, Did you guys use all three as well? With, um, I'm just going to switch over and come back to you, Antonio. With Revive being a new product, new, new name, how did you find partners and was it easy in a place like Hong Kong? I think for us, um, again, being you know, very new um, and, and lots of people quite intrigued with what Revive is, um, we, we actually had people coming to us. Um, so it was actually trying to filter out who would be the better partner um, and, and representative. Um, and, you know, we're, we're still learning. Could um, I ask any, any tips for if anyone here is getting a whole bunch of people saying, partner with us, what do you look for? What um, do you say yes to? What do you say you no? look for, um, you know, a similar audience and that crossover and demographic. And, I'm, you know, we, we partner together because, you know, again, we, we've got a sports IV that uh, a lot of the Guava Pass um, members would use. Um, so, so, yeah, for sure, it's, it's looking at that similar demographic. So, so if your segmentations match, that's perfect harmony, really. Okay. Wow, okay. That's already happened. Um, you might get a lot of questions later <laughs> with partnership requests. Um, so, without going too long into this, I've got just few more questions for you and then we'll open up to the audience because I know I can see urgent faces. Can you ask this question? So I will get back to you on this. Uh, but one major question I've had uh, from our audiences before as well is what's next? Because, you know, the wellness industry is not only new now, it's evolved, it's reached the stage where it's pretty mature in Hong Kong. Um, it's engaged a lot of the expat community. It's now blended into the local community quite widely. So what's happening in 2018 that every wellness brand should watch out for, in your opinion? 
in the digital space as well as possibly the offline space as well if you have anything there. Tell us a little bit more about how that works, because I'm clueless about what bungee fitness is. Um, so I was kind of wearing a harness, and then you're kind of like doing various exercises, like lunging, backwards, forwards, upside down, like aerial, like, it's crazy. Like bungee um, jumping. Yeah, yeah, so kind of, but you're within a confined space. Interesting. Um, and they also have like pound flow with drumsticks, so it's kind of like coordination rhythm, but it's like a cardio workout. They also have kangoo jumps, which are these things that they attach to your shoe, and you're kind of just popping around. I've yet to do that class, but all sorts of like crazy things oh, happening. Available in Guava Pass. Um, it is actually. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell you more later. So it seems like an approach of virtual reality is stepping in. How does it work for two very different brands? Then you've got comparatrices, which of course you can take them to the journey before they even start. I'll start with the vibe here. What do you see as the next big thing in the vibe? I think we, um, we're, we're in a position where we need to make it more available. So um, we, we do have a service where we actually come to you um, because it's that busy Hong Kong lifestyle where you don't have much time, um, but you need to feel better quickly because uh, you've got lots to do. So we actually offer a concierge service where we come to you. So we go to hotels, um, also uh, your office or your home. Um, so it's really sort of, I guess, expanding on demand to, service. To, yeah, oh, it's that. It's that. Hong Kong oh, it that's what it's called. You know, yeah, yeah. It's delivered it's to your doorstep, um, and, and yeah, expanding that. But also, it's it, it's got to be the educational piece for us because people need to know how it all works and and the, the plan is to go more educational with your product absolutely. throughout the year. Absolutely. All right. Is that the same? What, what's what's happening in that comparative space? Um, well, in Hong Kong, the on-demand is huge right now. So food delivery, beauty delivery, wellness delivery. There's an Uber for everything. If you, if you have a good idea and you can bring something to someone else, I would, I would do it now in Hong Kong. Um, the other thing that I do for looking for new wellness trends is I go straight to New York or LA and London. I go once a year. New York, in publishing and in wellness and in 99% of industries, is miles ahead in terms of the design and idea of something. So, tell us some insights. Yeah. So right now in New York, there's a place called in in Inkscape, which is normally when you walk into a meditation center, it's all like sage is burning and it's like a bit it smells a bit musty and it's a little bit like you know it's it's just holistic but a little bit old. Inkscape is this place in New York and it's like super modern, very Instagrammable. And people are craving these places in the city more so than parks now, where they can just go and be in silence. And it's been really, really pure has um, kind of pures, pures classes now have pranayama, which is breathing exercises. Um, so when you're hyperventilating and work, you can be like <laughs> five minutes and literally go breathe. And then like meditation spaces. And in big cities, the, the biggest thing that people need is some space, actually. Um, well, definitely in Hong Kong. For travel, um, virtual reality has been pretty cool. For travel, uh, you can be somewhere without actually being there. It's, it's quite interesting. Um, but what we're saying, seeing now is that with aggregators, we're just seeing more people that weren't able to before go into different business class because people are getting much more clever. There's a lot of companies that are allowing people to travel for a lot cheaper for a, in a more comfortable way. So we're kind of looking, there's like companies coming in and, and a lot of our business clients, a lot of our clients travel in business class, that's what they, that's what the class they travel. And, but now there's like private jet companies that you can, there's a lot of unutilized Uber private, for private there's jets. Uber for private jets. You can like sometimes get a private jet for like a super cheap price or like people. So we work with uh, airlines, we work with tourism boards, and we work with all these like private jet aggregators as well. And 
this is what's interesting. Everything, everything is, there's an Uber for everything now. And that's kind of. So very different stages, very different approaches here. Um, I'll do a quick blitz round then before we jump into the audience questions. Uh, I'm gonna ask you a simple question, uh, such as Facebook likes, do they matter? All you gotta say is yes or no. Sound good? Actually, let's start with that one. Facebook likes, does that matter? Because one of the key things is everyone this brand is gonna go get a pitch deck from an agency saying, we will increase your likes by 100%. Doesn't matter. Depends on who's liking. <laughs> <laughs> you can buy, I can buy you 100,000 Facebook likes if you want, but I mean, they might not convert. I had a lot from Indonesia there. I'd say not really, no one really cares. No one really cares. I like I think the same. Yep. Like, people are more savvy now, though. No to likes, all right. Um, spending money more on Google or Facebook? Yep. Spend, money more, that. spend money more on SEO content and then you'll get the organic likes. Spend so the actually, then the third option there is website. So spend money on your website is much lower. Yeah, Google for us as well. So Google? So Google. All right. Um, interesting that not many people are, people are moving away from Facebook a lot. Surprise, surprise. Um, so last question before I break into audience questions is, do you think the space in Hong Kong is too full for wellness brands. And if there is space, which part of wellness and lifestyle is available for people to grab in the audience, perhaps? Avoid yoga. <laughs> Avoid Pilates and bar. There's some great people doing this stuff. Um, I do think it's a good idea to find something that works really, really, really well in another country and look around and see if they're doing it here. That said, just because someone, just because a company exists that's doing something, maybe they're not doing it in a way that you want to do it. Or, so don't let that put you off either. Yeah, agreed with what Dorva said. There have been a lot of press, cold press juiceries. Uh, a lot of them have shut down. A lot of people doing tea for some reason. Um, so many of these brands, I'm not sure it's like healthy tea. No, we get approached all the time by people doing tea. Um, so many yoga apparel brands as well, and it's like, oh, I've identified a niche, but they really haven't, and you know, you kind of hate to break it to them, but it's all kind of the same stuff that's coming out, unfortunately. I think for Revive, um, there's, I mean, there's always going to be competition um, anywhere you go, and um, being the first really puts us, um, you know, ahead of the race. But I think for us, we're a global brand and a trusted brand, and it takes time to build your brand and gain that trust from your consumers. So it's using digital marketing to always reinforce that message and build the authority as early as possible before another player comes in. I agree with that, I agree with that 100%. So, before I let you guys go, I can see many faces. I'm gonna just walk around the room. Does anyone have questions for these amazing ladies? You can point it at one individual or all three to answer for you. Yep. So, in France, people are very resistant and when I hear Antonia or, or Dervla or you talking about sending emails persistently and stuff like that, I would like to know what is the consumer point of view because like, as I said, in Europe, consumers get really pissed off. I'm sorry about that, <laughs> yes. And like, um, they don't want to get all those emails. They don't want to be annoyed. They would like to have the, 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 um, the feeling that they are doing their choice. And so they don't want to be disturbed by that. So that's my first question. And the second question is, there's, there's an expression that really, um, this, in my head is virtual reality. It's like, how do we go from virtual reality to real reality in, in your business? Thank you. So we have two questions here. How, uh, I'll start with the first one, which was, oh, I'll start with the second one actually. Virtual reality to reality. How do you get there? And could you repeat your second question for me? Yes, it's more of what is the consumer perception 
of companies like you going after them? Like, do they, are they uh, accepting? Europe. Yes, I mean here, and how? You, uh, this will give me an idea about your. I mean, how, yeah. how they. Uh, how are consumers meant to deal with the onslaught of marketing in digital worlds? Uh, let's start which one ever you guys like to answer first. I'm going to start about my inbox because I'm really protective of my inbox. And I, I did a massive survey with um, some close friends and former colleagues about their inboxes and how they felt when they got emails. And we're in a different bracket. A retreat is something that when you're ready, you come to us. You know, if you're bombarded with a retreat, you might think about going, but we just want to be, the reason why we do a lot of um, aspirational branding is because we want to be the people that you go to when you're ready to come to us. So we're quite careful with our, um, our newsletters. In, 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 but, that, but that's because our market is very niche, it's very, very small. And How often do you send newsletters? Maybe like once every two weeks, only when we really have something to say or if we're doing a collaboration. But that's different because people on average buy one wellness retreat a year, whereas I personally go get IV infusions maybe once a month and I work out nearly every day, so it's very different for us. So how does it work when it's so different? Um, so just going back to the, the, I mean, because I know you mentioned that the spamming and protecting of inboxes and that sort of thing. We actually found that because I actually see a lot of the customer service tickets that come through into my mailbox, we actually don't really get that many people saying they want to opt out of these newsletters and not hear from us at all. So actually the, the pros actually outweigh um, in this sort of scenario because we actually do drive the conversions from that. And our strategy is to really just send out these flash promos and that sort of thing because people are taking advantage of them. And if you do opt out, we'll just get more email addresses from somewhere else at a different event and have target new, new people to target. Ongoing influx of emails coming in anyway, and how about revive? I think for us it depends on um, the the demographic because for revive, you know, wellness is for everyone. So you've got different demographics, different ages. You've got people that are on Facebook and people that are not on Facebook. So how do you hit, um, you know, our market? So our market, like I said, is quite broad. So. It, there will be different levels of touch points where you actually engage the person. Um, and, and it's actually getting that initial engagement, whether it is by Instagram or um, triggered from having an event where you've met somebody and then they go and research. So for us, it's to get that just initial interest for the person to then go back and do research, uh, which is why we need a more educational approach to the way we... Um, communicate with our audience. So it's step-by-step step oriented, and if they click on open one, send them the other one. This is referred to as drip marketing, if anyone was wondering. Um, second question, virtual reality to reality. This is a tough one, because if people are in the virtual world, how do you organically convert them to any of your human experiences? I'll give a good example of how virtual reality has, tra in, 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 and an example in Hong Kong. Um, Sean Lee Davies um, is a producer and a very, very good photographer in Hong Kong. He was trying to raise awareness about animals going extin extinct in, in Africa. He did a very big um, show in his gallery in the Prince's building. Upstairs, he had a virtual reality um, you know, device, and he had documented, he had made a virtual reality video about his experience visiting the animals in Africa behind the scenes of the photo shoots. It was, it was incredible. I went and I asked him where, where this was, and my interest in going to South Africa and, and seeing all these animals, it spiked it. And what he had was, he had, he had the link there that he could put me in touch with the people that um, had provided him with everything he needed for his service. So this is oh, how, is. yeah, it's not just virtual reality sitting at your computer. I think it has to be mixed with an event and an experience. It's a real theme yeah. that goes with it. Yeah. How about Guava Pass? You guys have hundreds of different activities on your platform. Do you plan on bringing some people virtually to experience some of the new ones, especially like Bungie Jump? Uh, we don't have that at the moment, but um, actually it's funny that you mentioned Sean because we were thinking of doing a collaboration as well with different types of gyms, different studios, haven't quite fleshed that out yet. 
Um, but I guess more of the threat for us is if live streaming becomes really, really popular. There's nothing to stop someone like any of us from just working out at home, just like do like a 20 minute yo yoga sequence. Uh, they don't have time to go to the gym, that sort of thing. So that ultimately is people don't want to go to the gyms and that sort of thing. Uh, but you know, you hear the flip side, people actually do need an instructor. Um, so to motivate you and to sort of be there and like shout at you and sort of see you in the background. Definitely my life. Um, so yeah, so exactly. So we haven't really had a huge issue with, and we don't, we, we haven't seen virtual reality in the studios here yet. Um, but if it does sort of take off, I actually do think it will be quite popular and it also saves um, on instructors actually physically having to be there as a present. So um, instead of paying for that, yeah, instructor, you can actually have another experience. Saving money on rent, which is extortionately high in Hong Kong and then also on experiences that you can do it from your home. All right, and what about Revive? Would you ever plan on going and entering into a space where people can experience an IV drip just to see if it's safe or not and some education? Yeah, I think, I think definitely from an educational point of view, but the, the proof is in the pudding for us. You know, it's, it's in the IV, you have to come and try it because it's a physiological <laughs> experience that you'll get. But for sure, um, and, but, you know, to engage the consumer, uh, virtual reality would be really interesting to talk them through um, how it works, how it's safe, maybe speaking to the doctor or the nurse. So um, that would be... And, and that's something quite interesting you mentioned there because people look at virtual reality as an individual experience, but actually it's moving on towards more like a, a seminar, almost like this. You could attend these in virtual reality in New York, like you said, uh, already. And you can ask questions by typing on your keyboard and a question pops up behind the speakers. So that's something that's happening already, that sort of live communication. Facebook Live, I think it's pushing that. All right. So any other questions? Yeah. Uh, right. Next for you. Hello. OK. Um, so this could be a question for all of you. Um, word of mouth is very effective in the health and wellness industry. So how and what do you guys calculate to identify someone as an advocate, for example? So how do you get the guys that spread the word for you? How do you, how do you check if, if they're the ones that should be doing it? Do you measure a particular metric? You can, um, so I'm, I work personally as an ambassador for a lot of the wellness retreats that we, that we advocate. So you, you can offer someone, say for example, look, for all your referrals, you can get a 10% commission and that's it, you can give people, so Como Shambhala, for example, give people a discount code with their name on it or something similar to that. A lot of other properties. track it at the back? They track it. They track it and return they track back. It. They oh, track it, okay. they track it. But that is, I would always say if you're doing like, you know, if you're giving someone something on a complimentary basis and you want to track it, then a, a, a discount code is a great way to do it or, or a referral code so that you can track it on your side. Um, that's what we do with Guapas as well. Um, and actually we found just on the referral stuff, um, it's great if you also give someone a referral discount to sign up for the, ma the membership, but we also give the active user a discount as well to incentivize them to, advise, um, to sign up more members. Hello. Oh, hi. Uh, I'm, I'm Joy, and then uh, thank you guys for the excellent sharing. Uh, I just want to, because uh, I'm a digital marketing professional, and uh, I do want to start my own business. So I just want to know when you guys starting your own business, right? What are the critical moments that you feel it's a push that you know help you drive further, like your own businesses? Even for Guava Pass, I know you guys. Maybe you guys have a like close close competitors everywhere like in the world, right? So what, what are the actual pushes or the moments that drive you guys? That's the question. How do you, in, during a startup phase or when you're about to start, what is the most integral part of your strategy? Just kind of be everywhere and do everything. <laughs> Uh, speak to as many people as you can uh, across different industries, just trying to build, just make noise pretty much. Um, there's, I mean, we had an issue with influence at the beginning because no one, there wasn't really that much to market. When we first, signed, when we first launched, we only had 20 uh, studios on the platform. Uh, now we have over 120 different partners. Um, so it's kind of just really kind of engaging, networking, um, just through as many different channels as possible. Um, and you always find that if you have a new story to tell, 
um, then people are quite willing to help you out um, and that sort of thing. Any other, anything else to add? Um, I think be very, very focused in what your key goals are. I, when I started, you're trying to do everything at once. And one minute you're trying to be on social media, one minute you're trying to do the booking portal, and then like, your, your website breaks down, and you're just, you're a bit like this. So I think sitting down in the morning and just saying, what are the top five things that I can get done today that will move me in the right direction? And having a key focus and knowing what your company is at the heart of it is, is really helpful. Because in the beginning, you, there's so many opportunities that present themselves. As a business owner in Hong Kong, as, it's weird, but as soon as you're doing your own thing, everyone wants to help you. That's what I found anyway. Everyone is just like, they're so helpful. It was crazy. And there's a lot of networking and entrepreneurship things. And, it's hard to know what to say no to. And that's actually, I think, what makes you successful is what you decide to say no to, not yes to. All right, fantastic. Any other questions? Maybe someone at the back. Uh, so this is for uh, compared treats. You mentioned about Pinterest and LinkedIn. That's unusual. So I wanted to know how you use that. and. Where did you take uh, the people on LinkedIn? I mean, they're all professionals there. So I was quite intrigued with that um, you know, uh, mention of yours. OK, so if you have a product that somebody needs to pay for, people need to make money to pay for your product, right? The people that have jobs are usually on LinkedIn. They're usually not on Instagram. Like, I mean, I mean, in general, they are corporate professional people or business owners that are generating revenue or income usually on LinkedIn. You don't really have someone messing around on LinkedIn because they're bored, right? They're usually quite engaged as well. Um, I, I had a career, I, I, I started off in banking and then I went into like venture capital for a bit and then I was in publishing. So I was already on LinkedIn. And what I liked about LinkedIn was that I wrote a lot of kind of, I suppose I was in lifestyle publishing, but I wrote a lot of like heavy hitting articles about certain topics that I felt like strongly about, and I published them in different publications. But I liked the audience on LinkedIn, and I liked the engagement. It was amazing. I remember, this is why Google Analytics is important. My personal blog at the time spiked to like 10,000 hits in like a few hours one day, and I was like, this makes no sense. I was like, something's broken. I call my developer. I went, back on, I went back to LinkedIn, I had posted an article about like a monk, a millionaire monk or something, and it just skyrocketed because people are, people are very engaged on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is really important. The way that you build it, you start connecting. It's super but easy. I think, I mean. Just for everyone, the question was, Will LinkedIn's postings convert? Absolutely. LinkedIn converts for us more than anything else. LinkedIn, LinkedIn, LinkedIn is second to first-hand referrals. What about Pinterest? How do you go about that? So if you think about Pinterest, if you're posting a 500-word article on your blog, you've already sourced five pictures for that 500-word article, right? Pinterest is another way for people to get to that article. So we take, we do boards and we do articles and everything like that. Um, and we come up, we, we post the photos onto Pinterest and we link them back. You need to link them back to the article or your website even somewhere. But um, text on pictures on Pinterest is really, really well. For example, how many people have Googled like how to make a vegetarian lasagna? And instead of going into the Word document of Google, the Word section, you go into images because you want to know the one that looks really, really good, right? This is why Pinterest is becoming really successful. Pinterest were miles ahead of the image search more than anyone else. So if you have a really, really good um, vegetarian lasagna picture on Pinterest, people will go to check your, and it's the exact same for like a beautiful retreat or like a super fit, a super amazing workout in Hong Kong. Um, it's, Pinterest is very good for traffic, but not conversion for us. It's still, I find Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest are aspirational platforms for us, for more, for more expensive products. Cool. So do we have any other questions? Anyone? If not, I'll just throw in one because I'm actually very curious about this one. And a lot of other startups have this question. Stock photos. 
you're starting your company, you don't work with a photographer by, start, by default. So do you have to pay for a photographer to take real photos? Do stock photos even work or do they look stupidly cliche? Not always the case. So when we first launched, and that's why it was a rush for us to get everything out there and make a lot of noise, because we had a couple of competitors at the time that we were trying to compete with and be first to market for Hong Kong. We all had the same stock images. There, were, there was a lacking in fitness images. We had that same like, Eurasian girl that was on all the, like, this, all the same ads. And it came to the point where we had one competitor actually come up to us. We actually told them, like, hey, look, we've been using this already. And they launched a couple months after us, and they're using the same image. And we're like, you can't do this. But then actually, we're like, actually, we, our team bought it as a stock image, so you can. Yeah. So it was kind of embarrassing. But if you looked at the website, even the flat lays as well, like some barbells, a yoga mat, whatever, people use the same images. Like, there was just such a lacking in that. Um, and now, if you have the content, the budget to it, you would definitely have to create your own content because... You can't have the same stuff. I think definitely you should um, invest into your own uh, images just because Hong Kong, it's a different market. And for us, uh, we get some uh, images from the US, which doesn't work for Asia. So it's just got to work for your market. So it's very important that you can. Could I just get ask, the what's the difference between an image come sourced from the US, for example? versus Hong Kong? Like what are the key factors that are different? For us, people have to relate to um, our product. So if they can't relate to it, which majority you know, of uh, people in Hong Kong are Chinese, so if the image isn't, if it doesn't have an Asian face, then it's less likely that they will relate to the person. Anyone inspired for another question? No? Oh, yep. Uh, thanks for your sharing. Um, my question is to all of you. Um, you've mentioned a lot of different uh, channels and activities. Just wonder that, uh, do you engage any uh, consultants or agents doing that, first of all? I know that most of for the startup, they would do it by themselves because all of this our open platform is, is, is competitive and much more easier to handle. And if not, no a any agents then, how do you, uh, overcome if there's uh, any digital marketing issue or difficulties. Yeah, how do you speed up your uh, learning or yeah, make it better? So, what do you do? Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. What do you do with an agency? Is either that do you need to rely on an agency for support, or what if there isn't the case? How do you? What advice could you give for startups to pick up that knowledge? I find it a bit, when I first started, because I, I do content consult, I do digital content consultancy for quite big companies and small companies in Hong Kong. So, and what I do is I tell them the best people to work with, and nine times out of 10, they're not companies, they're people. I would really highly recommend getting someone who has done it, for example, my sales and marketing was all over the place. So I found someone that I had worked with before she was not doing consulting and I just said, you know what? We were at Sassy together. She like sold the pants off the website. She was amazing. And I said, just sit down for five hours, take apart my company and tell me how to monetize each of my different platforms. She came in, she totally solved all of our problems. It was incredible. So I definitely think it's worth spending money on somebody telling you the right direction you go in, but make sure that the advice they give you is useful, relevant, and that you can use it. No point someone in coming in and sitting talking to you for two hours and handing you a spreadsheet. They need to like take apart your business and tell you what you should do. But I do think it saves a lot of time, a lot of effort of like chasing around in the dark, figuring out what you should do. And also you can just, you can actually just ask people. People are very help, happy to help too sometimes. So I, I'd agree with that as well. Uh, at Pad39, ourselves included, I think I've done that for years together with them. I used to call Nikki. Every time I had a tech issue, I'd be like, Nikki? I remember those days. Um, but yeah, getting a consultant um, to not work on the whole thing, but actually coming in and solving the strategic side gives you a lot more direction so you're not flying blind. Um, common, common trend among startups in Hong Kong as well. Anyone else? If not, I'd like to quickly thank... Oh, yeah, one more. 
question. So you are all based in Hong Kong, but um, how can I formulate this question? Would Hong, is Hong Kong like the stepstone for all of Asia, all, all the world, or where is, I mean, where does it stop? Where are the limits? Maybe Dervila is broader because uh, we, I don't know for, for the rest. I mean, for us, we had to, so when our, in, when our social media channels were all up and once our website was up, we did a Google Analytics of the, we did a lot of very strong SEO content so that we could organically see who was coming to our website. Hong Kong, London, Dubai, and New York. So in Asia, Hong Kong was really, really big, but I also think in part that wherever the founder is based and wherever the founder has a bit of like a history, that's, that's gonna be a big hub. But for us, outbound travel, there's a lot of HQs in Hong Kong. Even I had a friend move to Singapore who was in fashion. She was like, it's so quiet compared to Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong is, is, is crazy with activity. And I don't know if you guys find the same, but. Um, yeah, so I guess for us, we're already in 12 cities now, but to have Hong Kong as one of your markets, it's, it's critical. You have to have a major metropolitan market. I mean, we're like the gateway to China. It's very competitive here. So if we're going to be attractive to someone who might potentially buy at our company, you have to have Hong Kong as a major city. It's, it's exactly the same. Um, and, and that's why we chose to open in Hong Kong first um, to expand across Asia for revive. Ladies, thank you very, very much. Quick round of applause. Thank you for your time. Um, I'd just like to quickly thank a couple of our sponsors, including the three ladies here. Um, you all had packs on your seat, so the wine and actually a new brand from New Zealand called Atheek has launched uh, through a company called Isco. Um, so definitely, definitely check them out. Uh, they're brand new, fully, fully organic, and actually pretty cool because I've been using them as well. Um, and we have wine sponsored from Isco as well. And then on the back of that, we have uh, a single day pass with Guava Pass. We have a, a single session. Is that it? Yes, single session pass with Guava Pass. Do have a look at that. And with Revive, we have information as well. Yeah, and we also have a B12 energy booster shot. So if you need that to, to give you that energy boost to carry I'd on see working. You tomorrow. And <laughs> And definitely, definitely check out the Revelers Compare Retreats website. Uh, it will be in our package. We will email you everything, which is included also in a Pad 39 brochure you've received. If you haven't received that, you will get the PDF version as well. Uh, has all the information about our speakers. Uh, definitely reach out to them. And once again, this is Nikki. Thank you very much. <laughs>